Today we are rendering down our lard that we got from the pigs. But if you've never rendered lard before, there's a couple of tricks that you wanna make sure that you do so that it doesn't get scorched and you end up with some of that pure white lard that is premium and doesn't taste porky for your baking. Now, don't get me wrong, I like to have some of the porky stuff for when you're frying or doing things that are more savory like tortillas, but when it comes to my pie crusts and cakes and cookies, I really don't like the flavor of bacon in there. Now, my son who is a bacon fanatic may argue with me on that, but mom's the one doing most of the baking, so I get to pick. There are, so lard, comes from pigs. It's the fat that is from pigs, and when it's rendered down and melted, that is where we get our lard. Fat that comes from beef or cattle is referred to as tallow. So there are technically three types of lard or fat that you get on your pigs. You're gonna have the back fat, which is this these larger chunks. It's very smooth. It comes from the top portion, hence back of the pig, so you can see this really smooth, uh, comes in pretty large chunks, and there's still, you know, there's a little bit, you'll get a little bit of uh, meat and whatnot in there. Then you've got the pork belly, which I don't have any show in here because all of our pork belly got turned into bacon. Then you've got what is leaf lard. Now leaf lard is what is around the kidneys of the pig, and it is the ideal for your pastry and baking because it doesn't have very much of the meat or other tissue in it, and it doesn't taste like pork. It generally looks a lot more ropey, for lack of a better word, and when you, if you're not butchering it yourself and you're having a butcher, you can ask them to separate it out. I did not get mine separated out, and I think that this is leaf lard because it looks pretty ropey, but to be completely honest, this whole bag is pretty much all back fat. There was just a little tiny piece like this in here that could be a little bit of leaf lard, but predominantly this is all going to be the back fat. But don't worry, because you get more back fat on a pig than you are going to get of the leaf lard. But by using this technique that I use for rendering down the lard, you can still get some snow white lard that does not taste porky to use from your baking, baking, bacon, bacon, baking. Try to say those ones three times fast. Um, and you'll be really happy with that. But the first thing is you wanna start with it in a partially frozen or very chilled state. Now, sometimes your butcher will also grind it up for you. I did not have ours ground, and I don't wanna deal with cleaning a grinder that has had all this fat through it. I find it easier to just go ahead and cut it up. But I took this out of our deep freezer last night, had it in the fridge overnight, so there's still ice crystals on here. It's still partially frozen, but not frozen solid, and that is really ideal because once it comes to room temperature, it's fat, it's super slippery, it's a lot easier to cut yourself when you're trying to cut it up. Now we need to cut this up and to get it into smaller forms. So I just kind of come through and go into strips with the knife here. And so you can feel like I'm having to put down some pressure because this is still slightly frozen. But the reason we need to cut this up, one, it's going to melt a lot faster. See, you could get dangerous <laughs> and a lot more uniform. So we're going to cut this up in about one inch chunks. Sometimes people will go to two inch chunks, but I would like this to melt a little bit faster so that I can show you guys all of this in one day with the filming and then get my kitchen cleaned back up in time for supper time. The key is that they're just cut in relatively uniform pieces so that you have even melting. So after I got these cut up, this is the fat back. You can see how this is just a really solid piece and it looks really solid and all uniform. This is the piece, this is actually leaf lard once I got into it. You can see that it almost has like a, a, a marbling looking texture. It's not as firm feeling and it has a different feel just slightly when you're cutting it. But that'll just give you a little bit of a visual there on the difference. I like to render down my lard in the slow cooker. I have tried many different options. I have rendered the lard down just on the stove top. I've done it um, outside on a big burner on our back porch. I have not done it in my oven because I don't really have any pans that are really large enough um, that I wanted to try it in the oven and I didn't want to have any spillage or cleaning of the oven. So. Of all the methods that I have tried, I do like the slow cooker the best. I feel like it actually produces, I have less chance of scorching and I feel like I get more of the baking lard 
which is what I'm after using the slow cooker. So I always put a quarter cup of water in the bottom of the slow cooker. This will end up evaporating off, but it helps it when it's first beginning to melt from scorching. So we're gonna then put all of our lovely cubed lard that we have here in there. There we go. And you can see where it's starting to melt just a little bit. Um, I'm gonna get a really nice conditioning on my cutting board. So we obviously wanna make sure we have our vessel completely full with the lard. Now, this piece here, you can see there's, there's a lot of blood and there's a lot of uh, kind of like connective, uh, different tissue in here. And because I have such an excess of lard, we actually um, raised and butchered five pigs and only one other person wanted the lard from the pig. So of course, I'm not gonna let that go to waste. So we ended up taking all of the lard from the people who didn't want theirs. So I have an excess of lard, so I can be a little bit picky. If you only had one pig and you were trying to get lard to take you through until the next time that you butchered, you may just choose to put this in and most of it, it will come out with straining anyways, but because I'm a little bit spoiled right now and have so much lard, I am just going to focus on these pieces that don't have a bunch of tissue or blood or you know, meat, other things like that in them. Now, one of the questions I get asked by a lot of people is, why on earth would we want to cook and use lard? Isn't it unhealthy? Well, first off, can we please put to rest the myth that fat is unhealthy and that low fat is the way to go? When you have organic pasture raised pork, and that it goes for any of your meat, then you actually have meat that has vitamin D, but also is high in omega-3s instead of omega-6. So any of your animals that you are eating the meat that have been raised on a more conventional diet where they're being fed a ton of grain and are not allowed to be on pasture, they definitely have higher levels of omega-6. And as we know, having too much omega-6 is not a good thing. We definitely want to be getting those omega-3s, but good grass pasture raised animals are actually quite high in omega-3 and lard actually has if it's a cholesterol concern lard has less cholesterol than butter i still love my grass-fed butter it's not going anywhere but having a diet high in these fats from animals that are raised outside of conventional farming shall we say is actually really good and healthy fats. So there's kind of been a lot of uh, myths. Plus, as you can see, the only processing that this has is simply melting it down and straining it out. It does not have the process that things like Crisco and a lot of those other vegetable fats have to go through uh, before we get to have them. And I'm talking of things like canola oil, um, Crisco shortening, that type of a thing. So. The wonderful thing too about this is we are able to use all parts of the pig or most of the parts of the pig. Um, so we are not wasting any of it. And not only can I use this in our cooking and in our baking, but you can use lard to make your own soap. So I can make many, many things for our family, which is what the homesteads of old did from the animals that are raised here on our farm. So we've got our last bit here that we are going to stuff into our slow cooker. Now, as this melts down, you'll have you know all the little nooks and crannies will start to fill in with the liquid, and so it's fine if it looks a little bit overstuffed, not a problem. So we are going to get this plugged into power. And then for like the first half hour or so, just to give it a little kickstart, I put it on high. Now this is just to get everything started to heat it heat up and to melt. I don't leave it on high, however, because I don't want it to scorch and I don't want it to get burned. 
because if you get it too high and you scorch it or burn it, obviously then all of the lard's gonna taste that way. But I've also noticed if you have it on too high of a temperature when it's melting, then even that first rendering, which is your pure snow white looking type lard that I would like to use for my baking, it can get a porky flavor to it that I don't want if the temp is too high. So I only put it on high for about the first 30 minutes or so, and then I'll bop it down to low and allow it to melt. But the method that I am using is great because as it melts, because as you saw, mainly this is a fat back. I just had a little bit of leaf lard in this. And so by using this method, even if you only have the fat back, the first part that begins to melt I usually do it in thirds. So when a third of this is melted, which I'll show you shortly, then that I call my first rendering and I will ladle off. And that jar is pure white, has no pork flavor, is excellent for baking. And then as it melts down again, then I do it again with the second third. And then that one is really great for doing things like crackers or tortillas or things where you don't mind like a little bit of a meat flavor in them. It's not very strong. It's not like it tastes like bacon fat, um, which the difference between lard and bacon fat, by the way, like if you've ever you know cooked your bacon and then you save that grease, your bacon grease, which is great, that's already been cured and has a lot more flavor added to it. Whereas lard has not been cured, and obviously it's not from the pork belly because that all got turned into bacon. So that's kind of the difference between your saved bacon grease and your lard, the difference is there. But then the very last, the third rendering, even though it's all in one pot, that is the stuff that's really savory, so it's great for, and has the strongest flavor of porkiness. Um, and so that's what I like to use to like fry meat or to maybe saute vegetables in where that's a desirable trait and you would like to have that in your meat, lard or in whatever you're cooking, I should say, flavor-wise. So it's been about an hour and we have drop here where you can see, as I said, as this begins to melt, it's definitely gonna drop down. I am gonna put this on low now, and you can see as it starts to get, it gets really shiny before it starts to actually melt. So you can see this part's really shiny. And then on the sides, these don't actually really look pink anymore. They start to look white and kind of almost translucent. And that's because it's hotter along the sides and the bottom, which is also why it's really important that we stir this. Oh, can you hear that? Yeah, we don't want it to burn on the sides or on the bottom. And then that'll also bring the hotter pieces that are on the outside more into the center and that will help warm the center up um, and transfer them out. So we'll just get it to melt faster and not be in any danger of scorching. So ideally you're gonna wanna stir this, oh, about probably every 30 minutes is adequate. Some hot slow cookers I've noticed like their hot tends to cook really hot or their low tends to be more hot. So know your slow cooker and if it tends to cook on the hotter side, then you may wanna stir like every 20 minutes, but usually about every 30 minutes is fine. But you can see we don't really have a lot of clear liquid yet. Now, if you don't have a slow cooker in order to do this in and you want to do it in the oven, um, you, can, you can do that. You're gonna to wanna to preheat the oven to, oh, about 250 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, just to keep that on the lower end. And then again, make sure that you are stirring it often. And how long does it take? Well, obviously it kind of depends on like the size, the larger chunks that you have. You know, if it's ground, it's going to melt faster just because it's smaller surface area. Um, and then also the volume, like how big is the container? Um, but for it to be all said and done, it's usually about eight hours and that's like every single piece is is rendered down and all you have left at the end is just uh the little bits that you can either turn into cracklins or you know what you've actually strained out but we should get to our first rendering mm, usually it's about about the three to four hour mark um so it's definitely something like you don't have to babysit it all day, but it's not something like you really can just put in the slow cooker and then leave for the day and then come back. It is something that you do need to be around and tending to every so often. So it's been three hours and we are going to start the first rendering. So you can see it's no longer pink. Any of the fat pieces, it's totally translucent and there is a lot of liquid that's starting to rise up and this level has dropped quite a bit. So when it's this full, I don't try to lift this out and pour it through the strainer just because there's still too many solids. This is hot, it's really heavy, 
and it can cause a big old mess. So I am just going to use my ladle here and let that fill with liquid. And if I get a few pieces of the lard in there, it's not a big deal, I'll just dump them back in later. But I'm going to spoon this through my fine mesh wire strainer. Now, if this was something that you were gonna be doing for soap, if you were rendering this lard for soap, and you wanted it to be really, really cure, uh, not cured, <laughs> that's what you would do with the soap after you had made it was to cure it. Pure is the word I was looking for. Then you can take cheesecloth and line your fine wire mesh sieve with that to get it even more clean. Finish my thought there, I'm getting too excited as I'm pouring this through. So now we're gonna go ahead and dump these bits back in so that this can continue to melt down for our second and third rendering. And we'll make sure I'm gonna give it a nice stir. There we go. And usually once you get this first rendering, because all of the other pieces of, uh, all the fat in here is warmed up, usually once you get the first uh, amount of liquid, it tends to go faster. So even though it took us about three hours to get to this point, um, I should be able to do a second rendering in maybe an hour, hour and a half. It shouldn't take nearly as long. Alrighty, so we're just gonna pour this in and I just use a funnel because I tend to be messy whenever I'm pouring anything and I don't wanna deal with wasting any of my precious liquid lard. So I've got a little bit of solids here, so I am gonna use the cheesecloth. Actually, if you have a coffee filter, that works really well too. Um, but we don't actually, we, we have an espresso machine, so I don't use a coffee filters anymore, so I don't have any. So I'm just gonna use this cheesecloth. I've actually, this is a really loose weave, very poor quality of cheesecloth. It's not what I actually use for cheese making that I had stuffed in the back of the drawer. I've actually put this over, I think about four times, but we're going to pour this through that. And you can see all those little solid pieces are getting trapped there. So in order to make this a full jar of the first rendering, um, it's just a little bit more of this melts enough. I'll probably just take a couple of ladles and put that in there so that this is a full jar. But then you just simply let it cool down to room temperature and then I put a lid and a band on it. Again, I'm not actually canning this. Um, and then I will put it, mark it as a first rendering, which I can usually always tell because it's that snow white color. I don't really have to mark it, but I do. And then it will go out into our fridge to be used throughout the next year or two. And then we'll get to the second and the third renderings here. So for the second rendering, I usually will go ahead and do just the same process and I'll ladle it out. By the time I get to the very end when there's not very many solids left at all, then there's not large volume and it's not nearly as heavy. So that's usually when I will just take the entire interior, you know, the whole, the insert here on the slow cooker and I'll just take it and dump everything through. Um, the fine mesh sieve with, we'll probably be since I've already got this dirty, go ahead and use the cheesecloth on there and then we'll be all done. Now with this first rendering, which is ideal for pastry baking, some people will use it in cookies and cakes like any type of bakings are sweet, but I gotta tell you when it comes to pie crust, pie crust made with lard is like no other. It is so good, flaky texture, but I have to say my favorite is doing half lard and half butter. The reason is I actually like the flavor of butter. And so I like doing the mixture and textural when I've used 100% lard in the pie crust, even making sure that it's completely chilled and coming from the fridge, I find that it's more, it's harder to work with. <laughs> I'm just trying to find the right words. Um, it's more tender, not just like tender eating, which we want a tender crust off. Obviously when we're doing pie crust, we want it to be flaky and tender and melt in the mouth. Fragile, that was the word I was trying to come up with. It's more fragile when you're rolling out your pie crust and like lifting them out and pinching and the, crimping the edges of the pie crust. When I use 100% lard, I found it is a little bit harder to work with because it's more fragile. So if I do half lard and half butter, it's like the best of both worlds and the best of both flavors and texture. So that is my favorite way to put this first rendering lard to use. So this is how much lard I get out of the crock pot. So you can see I've got two quarts here and then a pint. And this is the first rendering. So you can see once it's had a time to solidify and to set up, this is really white. 
And then this is the second rendering. It's still pretty white. And actually this still, even though this was a second rendering, this still had a very mild flavor. It would be absolutely fine for baking. But then as you get down here, this was the very last, this is the third rendering. And yeah, I just threw a little Sharpie on there on top so you could keep track of them. But you can definitely see that there is a difference in the color. This is definitely has more of a, a yellowish or a brownish cast to it. Um, even though there's not that much variation between one and two, there's quite a bit. If you throw three next to one, you can really see the variation in there. But this gives you a really good idea of the difference in looking at those of the renderings, all from the same fat that was put into the slow cooker, but just in the way that it melts down and as you're pouring off. Now, lard can be stored at room temp, ideally in a colder temperatured environment, but I don't wanna take any chance of mine going rancid. So I just pour it into the mason jars. It do not can lard. There's no reason to do so. And there's also no safe uh, times that we have established to know if it would be safe. So I keep mine, we have a fridge out in an outbuilding. And so I just keep my excess out in the fridge. You could freeze it also if you wanted to. And then I just have the jar that I'm working from. I have a couple of jars in the fridge between a, the Snow White version for baking and then the other one that I keep in there but they, it will last for at least up to a year. We're, um, usually we raise pigs sometimes every year, sometimes every other year, we gauge it by how much meat we have left before we go ahead and raise more. So it, I've had it last up to two years in the fridge without any problem, no issues of rancidity. But again, I don't leave all of mine out at room temp just because I don't want any of it to go rancid. I consider this very precious and wanna make sure that it stays good all the way through. If you want a printable version of all of this tutorial and information, you can click the link below and go over to the website and the blog and grab that. And if you are interested in the types of pigs that we raise and how we raise a year's worth of our own meat, then you can go and look at this video.